Hello. There's a forgotten world under our feet. A world of underground man-made structures. This is a world of danger and intrigue, of follies and oubelettes, pipe subways and priest holes. Some of our bravest explorers realise that there's no need to travel to distant continents, to Africa or the Antarctic, for instance, when the greatest adventures can be found just beneath us, in a fascinating subterranean land of industrial storage pits, ice houses and horizontal wells. <laughs> I'm Nick Catford and I have a passion for exploring our underground past with a camera. Anything from mines to nuclear bunkers to catacombs full of rotting coffins. I'm Sylvia Beeman. I am the founder of the society called Subterranea Britannica. I'm Mike Ashworth. I'm a curator at the London Transport Museum and I have a professional and a private interest in underground railways. I'm Roger Morgan. I went to an evening class in underground London in 1975. As a result, I joined the London Subterranean Survey Association and I've been an enthusiast for underground London ever since. My name is Pierre von Scheibner. I'm a German archaeologist and writer and I got stuck in or better under London. I'm Malcolm Tad. I'm Secretary of Subterranean Botanica. I love history. I love mystery. The underground fulfills this need in me. I've got a list of, um, of, of subterranean... Because I, I didn't realise it's just quite a... What, what a huge list it is. Everything from conduits to, of course, priest holes, railway tunnels, disused tube lines, burial chambers. Are any more interesting than, than others, or are they all... Equally interesting. Or sewers. Equally. Sewers are absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Mm. I think I mean, each of us has a particular I'm interest sure. in some parts of that list. Mm. What's but, yours? Uh, well, my interest is in kind of secret tunnels, you know, the, the tunnel from the manor house to the church, that sort of thing. Um, so why sewers? Because, I mean, if you go into a Tudor sewer, for example, the, uh, it, it, it's not so much the smell of history here, it's actually the <laughs> artefacts of it. There's very little smell, but in Tudor times everything was thrown down mm -hmm. the bog. And what you do find in there is, is very often extremely revealing. Mm. And periodically it had to be pushed out, of course. Oh yes, the <laughs> little boys were paid a little fortune <laughs> to push the stuff, because they were the only ones to man manage to get in there. So what sort of things have you found in Tudor sewers? Um, everything to confuse you from a Paleolithic scraper um, to a cannonball, you, you name it. And, and, and one in Chelmsford we found about a, a two, two or three thousand smashed chamber pots and uh, glass them. bottles yes, uh, that hover with the boots. <laughs> Generally underground the rubbish tells you a story, yes, what it yeah. looks like um, just rubbish to be ignored. If you look at it carefully, you can um, develop quite a history from that rubbish. The point about above ground is all cleared up. Everything's thrown away, burnt, disposed, but mm. history has left its record underground in, the, in rubbish and Because nobody bothers to clear it up. Well, I can... Uh, I'll go against that as well because sometimes if you have a superb underground structure it can be used over and over again mm -hmm. so the people coming afterwards actually clear out that which was there first so although I do agree that if it's been sealed then you have of course got a sealed record yeah but nobody ever clears an underground structure completely I think that's always been one of our rules with, with yes, underground exploration you take only photographs right. leave only footprints yes mm -hmm. if at all possible leave it where it is. If a site's going to be destroyed or lost or if it's going sure. to get vandalised, yes. then fair enough, take it out, put it in a museum. But if, if it's at all possible, leave it there for others to see. Mm. If you could find anything, Nick, what would it be? This might sound morbid. I would love to find a body. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened. It's, it's yes, it happened. Has, there, yes. there was a mine um, 
in, in the north of England, Buckton Gavel Lead Mine, uh, and uh, a local mining society were digging into a section of the mine that uh, hadn't been accessible for some years, and they indeed did find a body. Thought probably not to be an original miner, but a later explorer who maybe fell down a shaft really or one of, himself. And one of one of you, really. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, it did look <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> it did look a bit like that. But it would have been terrible trouble, trouble from the coroner, wouldn't you? No, the, well, the coroner was called in, oh, but yes, obviously... Yeah, you, and these they, people who find... You do everything by the book. Fighter pilots mm. it's still in their crashed aircraft. You know, I mean, the whole thing is incredible red tape. Mm. But as long as everything's well, done... What would the temptation right. be to... Yeah, to, 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 then there's, there's yes. nothing wrong with no. that. Mm. And, and it, it's, I, I know it sounds a bit morbid, yeah. but it's just something I, I'd like to... It does sound well, a little I can tell you a marvellous story from the Netherlands, which happened about ten years ago, when we were actually over there for one of our conferences is that uh, some of our members were going down underground at night. When they turned up at the uh, site, there were a lot of police cars around and an ambulance, and they didn't know why. And eventually it turned out that a man had taken his dog for a walk in 1946, and he had disappeared. And they'd actually found the body that night. What about the dog? With the dog was close by oh, also, right. yes, the skeleton of the dog. That was 1946, and it was about 1986 that this, this happened. Got all the mm -hmm. paper reports. Mm -hmm. But Nick, do you remember the times we've had in catacombs with, with all those coffins? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, and, and on the subject of bodies, um, this was taken in the, the catacombs at Kensal Green Cemetery, and there is a skull. And I seem to remember that was the uh, corridor he told us not to go down. <laughs> that was, yes, we <laughs> really <laughs> said, and you went. That was the one corridor we weren't supposed to explore. And that was the reason, because of the skull. Yeah, I don't know whether he was thinking perhaps we you know, might be concerned about it or we might take it away. Mm. Um, be a bit but it, it is there. They, there are public trips to, to the catacombs at Council Green, um, and that is the one passage that they don't show you, which is a shame. Mm, but understandable. And I, I personally you know, wouldn't want to find a body underground. No, neither do I. I think most people yeah. wouldn't want to. It's, it's just... No, I don't want to find a recent body, you know, a... a a, a recent murder victim, but it, it, it would be nice perhaps to find an old miner who's, you know, died on the job or... Mm. No, but this... I've, I've seen, an, I mean, I actually have seen a, a, a mining body, an accident body, um, mm. in an open cast site in Scotland, um, and it really does sort of set you thinking. I mean, admitting that the history of coal mining, which I was involved in, has a tendency to sort of circulate around mining disasters and mining accidents, um, and occasionally, I mean, some very sad relics did turn mm. up, and it, I must admit, I found it quite strange, um, you know, because there is a personality attached to the remains that you're finding. Mm. Um, and uh, in, in some respects, to say, there was so little that it could tell you or, or, could, or could do in terms of history. Um, I, I must admit, I found it very, not upsetting, but quite strange. Mm. And presumably there are still mines with 30 miners buried behind a rock fall that have just been left. In, in, yes, been, without a doubt. I mean, yeah. certainly, I, I once talked to a, a, a colliery engineer who I knew very well in Scotland, and he told me actually one of the grimmest things he ever had to do, and this was in the 1950s, was take the decision to seal a colliery that they oh. knew people were underground in. Um, and um, in that respect, I mean, certainly one or two of the collieries that we did work in had sections that undoubtedly had human remains in. Um, and of course they're very recent and it was, it, it was, I know, inordinately distressing for the rest of the workforce in that colliery and of course for the local community. Mm. You know, it was really seen as being very sacrosanct and I must admit in that respect I was, I was quite happy to walk away from that. Mm. But then I must ask, do you think that my introduction was fair? I said it was that greater adventures can be found underground than in distant lands, distant continents. Do you think that's, mm. you think There's that's one true? aspect I'd like to mention, and that is that uh, we don't normally go into natural caves. But uh, on the other hand, we mustn't forget the natural caves because they're also man-used. Mm. And I'm particularly interested, for example, in the Paleolithic uh, cave paintings and mm. things like that. And also you get paintings and graffiti in the sea caves, modern um, graffiti at Weems, for well, example. Sometimes it's a bit difficult Scotland. to tell. That it's very difficult to date graffiti. Sure, that's the problem. Sure, it yeah. is very <laughs> difficult. It's easy to write 1762 on a wall, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but did I write it in yesterday? 1948? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want to buy a tube tunnel. That's for sure. I think one thing we would never do: we would never leave any kind of graffiti no, at we all. Don't. Well, you'd Oh, right. Not we, 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 no. you, you, but if you, you found it, would you, would you strip no, it? Well, no, no, no because graffiti it. is still part of the history. Sure. Um, mm. Often uh, tunnels may be reused at a later date, mines might be reused as air raid shelters during the war, right. and, and people from 
that time might have left their details on the wall because mm. they, they've got time to spend mm. in the tunnels and, and they leave their name and, and, and that's all part of history. So the original graffiti is fine, but we would never add to it. I'm very interested in reusage. Does that happen a lot? Do, for instance, um, Tudor secret passages become disused, become tube lines and so on? We've never had uh, anything like that. I think everything that has always been built for railway operation, the closest to that is the East London line, where, of course, the Brunel Tunnel was actually built for a pedestrian tunnel um, and then altered in 1869 to, to run a railway through it. Um, we are in the situation where things were built as tube tunnels, which then ceased to be them, particularly air raid shelters and command centres, Second World War use like that. Um, I know other people here um, have experiences of other types of, of abandoned railway structures which have ended up being mushroom farms and such like things. We, we haven't had that. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, it's very Chisel common. Caves. Yeah. Malcolm's the expert on mushroom farms. That's right. Well, they do go and I forget. <laughs> well, I, I'm, an ex, I'm the world's expert on the, <laughs> the use of underground space for growing mushrooms because I'm the only expert. Um, <laughs> Why it, it underground space as opposed to sheds? Or well, the fails. only reason p people use underground space because it's there. It's a rather stupid place to uh, grow mushrooms. It's entirely wrong, but it's available space. What else do you do with underground space? Mm -hmm. But it goes back to this rubbish business. I was um, looking at rubbish in some mines and realised it belonged to the mushroom previous mushroom growers and I discovered there's a history behind growing mushrooms underground that stretches from uh, from Paris in the 18th century they started growing mushrooms underground in uh, under Paris in the 18th century and it spread out and came to England from there but it it comes to this point that if you study underground things, you start studying all sorts of other things. Right. And I found myself, for example, studying Napoleon III because Napoleon III, the mushroom growing industry under Paris was destroyed by the siege of Paris. And I think the mushroom... Deliberately? Well, no, they, they fought the battles in there. It was a good... good so nobody actually said no more underground uh, Telephone lines were laid to the, the caves, the mushroom-growing caves, and the soldiers came in, fought each other. Uh, but um, I think the mushroom growers from Paris um, were to suck refuge in uh, Britain and Napoleon III also came, but there's a whole involved story. Do underground mushrooms taste different or better than, than um, no, the no, underground no, ones? No, yeah. exactly the taste same. Exactly yeah. the same. There is another reason, reason actually why um, mushrooms were grown underground in some places. It's because of the, if you've got fine chalk that's lying around, it's quite useful to be able to mound up um, the, the mushrooms as they're growing. Um, with this, this chalky material because it helps them with the growth. Yeah. That's what they're... Yes, it's called casing. Yes. You put it over the mushroom yes. beds. It, it's quite complicated. But I, like so it. I've always been in, under a delusion then. I, I'd always thought that something like, you know, mushrooms had to be grown in the dark or they had to be in cold, humid conditions. Not, not no, so. No, they have to be grown in very carefully controlled conditions. Yes. Right. If you want them, the mushroom grown we saw at Bradford Avon was in, all in bright light. Wasn't right. it? Yes. Very <laughs> different from that which is grown in Maastricht. That, that is the mine at Bradford on Avon, which is now being used for the there mushroom are mushrooms. and it's, it's there are brightly floodlit. Yeah. But going back to your question about you know exploration and uh, kind of the uncharted world, I mean that's that's kind of make, what makes me enthusiastic. The idea is that. You know, the underground is unknown and the surface is known. You know, that everybody can see the surface, it's visible, it's quite ordinary. But the underground is, is, is hidden. Yes. You can't see it. It's like, a, it's like the white areas on the medieval maps you know, that had, you know, here be dragons. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a whole realm out there, unappreciated, which can be explored. Mm and is undeveloped, whereas the surface is very well developed. Although, oddly, it is charted. I mean, it's charted in a way that, say, the Kalahari Desert isn't. It's charted because it has been built. It, well, <laughs> there are disputes about that. I mean, what generally happens when somebody builds something underground is that they start off with a vague plan, 
they build it, because they encounter problems, the things are moved slightly from where they intended them to go, and very often they never actually produce a final plan of as built. I mean, water pipes, gas mains, sewers, there are vague plans, but no one will put their hand on their heart and say, OK, it's within six inches of that position. I mean, if you find a manhole there and a manhole there, it's a very great error to assume that the pipe goes in a straight line between them. Yeah. One of the odd things, um, I know certainly in, in the tube railways, we do actually have quite concise records. I think that's one of the fascinations. We have drawings in the museum, and I can tell to the day that the tunnel lining rings on most sections of the tube railway were put in. Are you sure the positions of the deep tubes yes. that accurately? Yes. We are, actually. It's, it's, a thing, it's a thing that <laughs> London Transport increasingly have yeah. done. I mean, we've had to um, on the Circle Line. You're a bit instance. secretive about it, aren't you? We, we do know. We really do. Because, yeah. I mean, admittingly, although the parliamentary legislation lays down lines of deviation, they were actually quite good. I mean, it's certainly very oh, different in the coal mine. Do you know lines of deviation? I once had an argument with somebody about lines of deviation. He professed to know the answer to a question which I put to him. I mean, do you know anything about this? Can I just ask you one put out? I, I want to hear this, right. but, but first I, I feel it's fair to ask, um, what are lines of deviation? Right, well, all railways are authorised by Parliament, mm -hmm. and there are plans submitted to the, as part of the parliamentary process which show the surface features, and it shows where the authorised railway is going to go. Mm -hmm. And what is shown is a single line, which is the centre line, and then there are two lines, one either side of the centre line, which are called the limits of deviation. deviation. Uh -huh. Now, the question is, can the railway go outside these limits of deviation? I was told that somebody had made an exhaustive study of this subject about Victorian times. I don't know whether it's true nowadays. And what the limit of deviation was, it wasn't the limit of deviation of the railway. It was the limit of deviation of the centre line. Of the um, railway? Yes. So the centre line, if it was right on the limit of deviation, would the actual railway would be over the limit of deviation. Do you know whether that's true or not? I don't. I'll <laughs> have to look into it. <laughs> but is, is, I was wondering, is it a dangerous pursuit? Have any of you ever been in? In grave mortal danger. I, I can think of dangerous areas yes. that we've been to, but we've been aware of the dangers. Mm. For example, in 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 metal mines, uh, the the ore is taken out vertically, and um, they would often build a wooden platform across the areas of worked out ore, uh, which could be quite safely walked across. Mm -hmm. Now, over the years, those timbers have rotted and we might find ourselves walking across uh, wooden timbers um, that are rotting with maybe a 300-foot drop below you. Um, but you know the situation and you, you take precautions and obviously if, if you're going to go into that situation you'd be roped on and uh, as far as I know there have been very, very few serious accidents from um, properly equipped underground explorers. Mm -hmm. You get the situation where children go blundering about underground. I, I can remember one time in the West Midlands, um, there's, a, there's a large system of, of underground stone quarries uh, near Dudley. Uh, and I, I was having a look at them one day and, and as I went in there was a party of about 20 people coming out. No safety equipment, no hard hats, no protective footwear and one torch between 20 people. Now, Did what, you say anything think, to them? Think, I did. Hmm. But, you know, they laughed. But think what would have happened if they were half a mile into what is a dangerous mine if you've got no light, hmm. uh, and your one torch failed. I mean, people very often overestimate what they actually can do. Hmm. I mean, similarly, I, we went down a uh, Dean Hall in Darren's, and somebody had misused the thing by throwing an old motorbike down it and the handlebar was sticking vertically up the shaft. Now we moved, so we couldn't get it out, but we moved it aside at least. Mm. Um, a week later, we read that the fire brigade had been called to it. Some kiddies had gone down there on the washing line oh, and dear. naturally the washing line broke and they went straight down and they ended up in the spoil heap, so they were relatively okay. Mm. 
bit bruised, but if that motorbike still had been there, hmm. they would well, have they found fall out in how the kebab feels. Did they fall in the exact place where the motorbike was before you'd moved it? Exactly. Hmm. Uh, the history of, for example, mining is something totally different. I mean, up to 1911 or so, you didn't need to produce any mining plants if you had less than a certain number of people working underground at any given time. Yes, now, true. many of the chalk mines were created by uh, uh, gangs um, of no more s uh, than six or seven people, and they produced enormous uh, cavities and mine workings very often. Um, to recreate those plants, to find certain structures before they find you mm. is a vital aspect of the whole thing. Um, also what has to be seen that where something like London Underground was built by professionals, chalk mines were built by brickies, brickmakers, mm. who in wintertime had absolutely nothing to do except digging for chalk. And if they were lucky, they had an experienced colliery manager with them. Very often there wasn't one. Mm -hmm. And uh, once uh, the bottom fell out of the market for bricks, uh, the entrance to the shafts were uh, disguised and the land was sold as building material. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, memory uh, is a peculiar thing. Certain things stay in people's folk memory for hundreds of years. Oh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, so mine workings seem to disappear practically instantaneously out of people's memories. Mm. There, are, there are so many shafts that are capped mm -hmm. over the years, and at the time when they were made safe, they were ma maybe made safe with, with timber, which was fine, but a hundred years on, when it's gone from people's memories, um, you can be walking across the moors and you walk across one of these old caps and it just gives way and, and down the shaft Certainly, again. I know in Scotland when, when we worked in the mining museum there, a marvellous case of the corner of a bungalow that was partially built over a shaft. Um, and it was again the case, particularly in coal mining, I mean the, some of the counties of Scotland are almost hollow in places mm. and it's fitting that information together, I found that quite fascinating. We had certain people who were trying to sort of, you know, square ordnance survey maps up with mm. the survey plans from the Coal Mines yeah. Act. Um, and the thing that you found, the more you went into it, actually, the less you knew in an odd way. Well, I always remember you, Malcolm, telling me something fascinating, which I've always remembered. As a, as a, I'm, a, I'm a great student of human, human nature uh -huh. and psychological perception. You said that... Me too. When, I, think it was, I think it was you, said that when you go into a mine, like a, long, a large labyrinth like Godston, mm. you think you can remember the route. Mm. You, you're going f through these passages and you remember the route, and you think, I'll remember how to get out. First time. And then you turn around, and of course, you're seeing it in the other direction. Mm. And it's a strange psychological process of the human brain that mm. a route in one direction looks completely different from the same route yes. looking the opposite yeah, way. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And people have wandered around Godston and been within 30 feet of the exit. We, we and found think people who that they, they, they weren't any near the exit. Mm. So I can right. tell you an example when I was in France, which was quite frightening. I went uh, into this um, quarry with a, an elderly gentleman and I actually did leave, being proper caving code, I did leave exactly where we were, little notes on my dressing table. And he had a map and he said, well, it's quite easy. Every time we get to a crossroads, we will turn right. So therefore, when we come back, we will turn left. Well, every crossroads we got to, I might add it was a chalk mine, and uh, we left a candle in the centre of the crossroads and we turned right. Mm. And so we left five candles, so we'd, we'd gone to five different um, crossroads. Then we decided that we'd had enough, we'd walk for about half a mile and we turned round to come back. And as we get, got to the crossroads, we were picking up the candles. Unfortunately, we only picked up two, two of the candles and we'd left three burning somewhere and we, to this day we never knew how it was that we had had a short circuit back to the entrance. <laughs> but the thing it could have been very dangerous, dangerous, but we had a map. We had the a thing map. to remember is occasionally turn round and look behind you as you go in. Yes. No, if you leave candles or anything, a trail, you must number it so that you come back in the well, we did. sequence. But, but you see, the whole thing was somewhere along the line. We turned uh, one direction wrong.
<laughs> and we left three burning. It wasn't of any d danger. It didn't matter leaving the candles. It was just. You have to keep on glancing behind you, so you're memorising yeah. the routine. Yeah. 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 People do, though, get very disorientated. Yeah. It's sure. interesting from I think you've got another problem there because above ground. That there's so much sensory input, you have mm. everything's impacting upon you, the light, the vision, the sound, and in fact above ground you close in on yourself. If you go below ground you're in a very private world and, you're, and you don't go into yourself, you go out and your observation processes are enhanced, your senses are enhanced below ground. And Certainly the man-made, when you're in something like walking up um, a tube tunnel, it's because it's all so much light for light. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, I think that's fascinating, you know, no matter, you say you look behind, yeah. and if you're, walking, you between, between precisely, you're <laughs> walking in between two stations in the middle of the night, I can assure you, you turn around and you go, excuse you're me. You're not you know. likely to get lost, are you? No. You may not know which direction you're going in, but it's, it's a single route. Cam you know Camden Town's probably the only oh, place Camden you possibly town. could. Oh, you oh, might oh, come oh, up at morning to Green. play silly tricks on us anyway. I mean, however, however much true about the old set is. I mean, for example, when you go, when you think now of any underground feature you have ever been in, how do you remember it? Generally, relatively well lit. Yes. 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 Uh, That's because a Because your brain psychology. doesn't yes. allow yes. you right. to remember yes. anything that no, you can't no, see. No, no, so no, you yeah. build. Yeah, you remember darkness, though. I, I certainly remember it with the with the coal industry. Um, and I must admit, actually, I quite like that. I must admit, mm, I find it like it's it's like a velvet. Yeah. It is. It's like it's a incredibly velvet. Incredibly relaxing. Yes. Like a what? Like velvet. It's somehow mm. it sort of yeah. envelops you like yeah. a velvet. But is, is, you're quite right, actually, in that respect. Of course, if you know, if you can't see, you can't, <laughs> you remember. can't remember. What you're remembering, <laughs> of course, is is the actual what is the see. is the, the feel of darkness, right? But you said, Roger, else. pure darkness. Is that the only time when well, you can really it, experience uh, pure you, darkness? You, 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 it is quite difficult to experience total darkness, mm. actually. You know, yes, there's always starlight, reflected yeah. light from street lamps creeping in through cracks. Mm. Um, mm. I mean, and one's, one's dark adapted eyes are, of course, you know, 10,000 times more sensitive than, than light adapted eyes. So, mm. I mean, they'll, they'll pick up the slightest glimmer if you've been in, in darkness for an hour. Mm. So, I mean, to get somewhere where it is, there is absolutely no light mm. at all is quite an unusual experience. Yeah. It is. And, and of course, you've got experience. little sounds. Yes, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's. So, you're in a. Yeah. And it's relaxing, isn't yeah. it? You get and the constant temperature. You know, it, yeah. as you're saying, it's yeah. sensory deprivation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, interesting because a lot of people seem to think that underground is quite frightening or quite scary. Sure. And it's interesting how I think nearly everybody here tonight actually finds it very relaxing. Mm. It's quite natural in some strange Is the underground way, better than the above ground? I think it's complementary. It's different. It's different. Yeah. It's different. Just it's another, another image. aspect, another yeah. image. Yeah. Well, let's face another it. If reflection. you have a terrible hot day, it's quite pleasant to be. It's, it's often the nicest all, place to be, yeah. and it's quite nice in the winter as well. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any time, really. The thought of coming out in the winter, if it's snowing or if it's mm. wet, mm. you don't want to come out. You want to stay there as long as you it's can. It's nice and warm. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There's <laughs> another interesting aspect of the underground is that you lose the sense of time when you're underground. Um, if, if you've actually been doing some excavation work, as I have, because I'm an archaeologist, um, you, you suddenly realise that an hour's gone past and you think it's only been about a quarter of an hour. And that also apparently applies to the fact that it's the sun. Yeah, it when must be the daylight angle. Yes, yeah, so it's the daylight yeah. angle. And, and also, and you're doing something you're very interested in. Sure, sure. <laughs> but also, uh, they have done some uh, experiments with people in natural caves, and they have been way out, literally weeks out, mm. with their re with the mm. records. Which what? Yeah, these what people time stay down there for months. Yes, yeah, mm. the, the, the circadian. Right. Rhythm. And they're completely way out. Yeah. Do you find that you can sense when you're when you're just walking around? Normally, do you, do you find that you can sense an underground man-made structure? I used feet? to be able to, but uh, I seem to know where most underground places are now. Well, I you really know the you signs. If, you, if you're walking around on the surface, for example, in a mining area, you, you, you can just look round and you can see where the mines are going to be. Sure. Mm. But does it go further than that? Do you think it's a connection, a connection? I don't think there's a psychic connection. No, no, no. But I mean, no, I think you can tell no. certain buildings, especially um, Cold War buildings. I mean, your filters are yes. tuned yes. for the characteristic signs, which some people may not. I mean, the majority of the population wouldn't be tuned to. Air I mean, shafts, water, and concrete yes. has a very particular look. Okay. Mm. Yes. <laughs> 
I don't agree with Roger. I think there is a psychic oh, aspect. Yes, you're into the psychic, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> no, you can tell from a building if it has an underground aspect you to can, it. You yes. can, You can always tell. Just look at the building, look at the surrounding land. And are you there talking are, psychically tell -tell. or are you talking... Well, no, you just get... I think no. just experience. from visiting experience. a lot of sites. Experience. Experience. You're just yeah. picking yeah. up on the hints that are there, sure. I think. Yeah. And also that depends... building has an underground site, yeah. uh, an underground aspect to it, you can tell. Mm. Depends on the geology, too. For example, if, if you're on chalk, then you're more likely to have cavities underneath on chalk because it'll be reasonably stable mm. uh, and also for uh, stone mines and things like that is that, that stability of the underground. But it's amazing how unobservant but ordinary people are. Sure. I mean, in Kensington, where I go to work, um, some builders glued a 50p piece to the pavement and then sat on a, on a seat <laughs> watching and I sat with them. It was fascinating, it really was. I mean, only about one in 20 people even saw it. Mm. I mean, people just do not look at their feet. They don't no, look at manual no, covers. No, no. It's, it's a bit no. of you to glue it. Can you actually uh, <laughs> just let them have it and put another one down? But they that's don't look at I'm very observant on the surface, that's the point, because we're always looking for underground places. Mm. Well, Malcolm, I want to hear about the, about the, the, the psychic feelings you, you have had. I'm in the minority here. Yeah, well, when I, f I first started going underground at Merston, when I used to pass it on the train, and I used to get my strange sensations that there was something there. And it started from that. When I actually got to go underground, I realised it was connected with there. But I I've um, walked around many other places and, uh, and felt there's something underground, and we've eventually got into them. And it's connected with dowsing. Yes. Dowsers do that. Yeah. Yes, that's but true. But only dowsers use instruments. And well, the instrument is only it, is not essential. No, I've talked to dowsers, dowsers who say that actually, it's you know there is a feeling that the yeah, instrument the, the, just the, amplifies. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that's right. A dowser How does the feeling manifest there. itself? How does the feeling? Well, I, you can't explain that really. It's just. Um, I, I, it's really impossible to describe. I know that's a cop out. Sticking us in it the is park. a cop out, <laughs> right? I don't know. There's a intense, concentrated feeling that something's there somehow. Um, I, I a, believe... a desire to go exploring it and find out if you're right. Yeah, well, that, that's how I started, of course. <laughs> yeah. So this is the ten. Oh, it's mm. the fact that it's very tangible. Start, I how did I start? I well. I'm not, my interest in the underground stems from kind of two different directions, really. I, as a child, I was brought up on Rupert books. And Rupert always has this wonderful underground adventure where you know, a hatch in his lawn mm. opens up. Uh, Rupert the Bear was constantly going underground. He was, yes. And yes. there were little railways and flying bridges and imps of spring mm. and caverns and underground waterways and tunnels. And uh, there's this wonderful underground world, all accessed from his lawn. So, I mean, that always caught my imagination. And then, when I was ten, I went to live in the grounds of a, a large Palladian mansion in Warwickshire called Wootton Hall. And being a small child, one would ferret into the... Uh, it, was, it was converted into flats, so there wasn't really much... There, was some, there were some public areas. And it had huge cellars, which you could just walk down into. And so, as a small child, of course, I would explore these cellars. And in one corner of the cellar, there was a rectangular opening and just a tunnel going into darkness, about four feet square. Um, and this was your proverbial secret tunnel from the manor house to the church. And, uh, you know, it always caught my imagination. And I read up on the history, there was a history of Wooden Wall, which, which mentioned it. Did you go through it that day? I never did, you see. I've still got to go back and go through it. Because, <laughs> you know, I was a small child. It would have required waders. It was full of water. Um, but apparently it's 300 feet long. Um, so Have you always regretted it? I've always in... regretted it, always regretted it, yes. You must go back. Yeah. Must We're go. all going to go back Yeah. <laughs> you must do it. <laughs> One area of, of uh, underground man-made structures which we haven't, um, and it's quite, I guess quite an important area really, is... is um, is, uh, is underground public toilets, <laughs> Malcolm, you're, you, and you know a lot well, about those. <clears throat> as you two said, they tend to strip things out underground, but for some reason, you, yeah. w lots of, f um, in lots of underground structures, you find the toilets remains, mm. which puts a sort of emphasis, as I've already said, with heightened senses, everything you see underground becomes significant. And there's this 
inches. You've got an obsession in looking for toilets underground. Yeah. And, and I mean, air raid shelters, the thing you always look at is the toilets, isn't it? Well, because it's probably <laughs> the one thing. I mean, you do get bunked sometimes. And you begin to realise there's some sort of historic sequence in the story behind toilets. And then, of course, underground and above ground, then you think, well, around these cities, there's all these underground toilets built in Victoria. But they're being time. got rid of. Yeah, yeah they're being reused. Well, there's one near underground. where I live, which is now a hairdresser's, I believe. Or no, a health and beauty centre. Yeah, I've, I've seen florist. one in. Uh, yeah. But they're Rosemary. closing the Rosemary Rosemary Avenue. Yeah, this is used, bad. used for, for that. And there's, is the, isn't there a snooker hall at uh, Shepherd's Bush? Shepherd's Bush, Bush yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But quite a lot of inflation. All film. these mm -hmm. abandoned underground yeah. toilets uh, uh, for, for post. I don't know. He said posterior for posterity. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. People will be watching this, and, and certainly the Londoners amongst amongst the viewers will be watching this. And tomorrow morning they'll be going on the tube, and they'll be going through those tunnels. What would you say to them to look out for? Press your head against the glass. Yes. Hold your arms, <laughs> hands like that. Peer <laughs> at the tunnel wall. And occasionally, you will see it go all black and open up into things that you never knew were there. You see, you know, when you I point did out... I uh, did that on the Channel Tunnel mm. trip. It's, it's hard to think yeah. something yeah. so common as the underground. There are people, actually, who really do find it quite distressing. I mean, sure. I've been on trains um, when we've had power failures mm. and had to calm people down. And, mm. and some people do, oddly enough... Um, don't want to sort of embarrass my, my GP. Um, I don't like flying. Um, I'm quite happy underground, but I don't like being 35,000 feet up in the air. Simple mm. as that. Um, and I went along to sort of, you know, get the tablets to calm me down before a flight to New York. Um, and my doctor said, he said, why? Actually, he says, the thing I find most frightening is when the train, the tube train, goes into the tunnels at Leighton. <laughs> he actually didn't like the yeah. sensation of all of a sudden plunging into the oh, underground. That's a very sensation I like. Yes, I mean, <laughs> it used to be marvellous on our old stock. It's not half as fun on the new. Mm. There are times where we've been underground. I can, I can think of one time at uh, some air raid shelters in Ramsgate where they claim to have the largest air raid shelter in the country with the four or five miles of it. And we were walking along quite merrily and we all started to feel a little light-headed. And we thought, oh, this is strange, no? We hadn't had anything to drink. So we lit a match and it, it wouldn't light. Oh and, and then we realised the, the air was thin. Sure. You know? And mm. it's the first time I'd ever experienced a lack of air. But it's something we always have to consider now when you yes, do go is. underground. Sure. If you're in a dead end passage where there's no air circulation, there can be a problem. Yes. Mm. No, generally, I think one doesn't panic underground. I mean, one has done it often enough. I think sometimes, I mean, my knees sometimes knock before I go down sometimes. I think I've panicked when I've got and stuck because I'm mm. a trifle overweight. <laughs> and I can think of, and this, this was a private coal mine in, in the Forest of Dean. And they said, um, oh, you can get up the, uh, the, the smoke flue. Uh, I don't think I can get up that. It's, <laughs> it's a little bit on the tight side. And they, they pressured me into going and I got stuck good and proper in this smoke flow well, that, that and that should never have happened and i couldn't i couldn't they couldn't pull me out they couldn't mm. pull me forward mm. uh, i don't think i i really panicked for long i, I thought well, no what am i going to do here i mean i'm in this silly situation um, but i calmed down uh, and i think if you panic you 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 fill out a bit yes, once, once you once you calm down yeah. uh, 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 and I, I i i came out and they all thought it was a bit of a laugh yeah. Mm. But I, I think anybody can experience, I mean, it's, that's very difficult to explain, but uh, colliery managers know about that as well. Namely, there are days where, for example, coal miners or so, where they feel, I cannot go underground today, something is going to happen. And no colliery manager would ever insist on somebody working, if they find some surface job for the day or something like that. Mm. Um, well, there's latent superstitions too, I think. Yeah, but it's, it's also, I mean, if with volunteers and so on, if somebody says they have a bad feeling about it, I mean, I wouldn't even try to persuade them or anything like that. If they mm. feel it's not okay that day, you take it serious because even though there is not a good explanation for it at the end of the day, you have to take certain things serious and that is premonitions that something might go wrong. Mm. I, suppose I'm I want to ask Roger, um, mm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a sensitive question of sorts, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, when we were talking earlier about the, um, the train going into the tunnel at, um, where was it? The, uh, the, the, Leighton. At Leighton. Yeah. And you said that the actual 
you know, the actual plunging sensation was, was very good. And, and there is, of course, you know, Freudian things about trains <laughs> going into tunnels. And I was just wondering, if, seriously, if you've, if you've ever thought that there was um, any connection? Well, the sort of Earth Mother womb cave worship sort of thing. And the, 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 the um, yes. um, you know, um, sexual side of it. <sighs> I don't think I've personally got much sexual problem of that, of that <laughs> nature. Not necessarily um, more, more, it's more, the, it's, more massive. Uh, the sort of comfort of the, of the underground, perhaps, yes. Uh, but, I mean, I always remember reading a wonderful description of a tram going down the Kingsway tram tunnel, like, like a liner going down the slips. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the, the idea of straight under is, is rather good. Um, I hadn't really thought about it, to be honest. But if you're following this psychoanalytical vein, I like to think as the underground, as sort of mankind's collective unconscious, because that's where the residual memory of mankind resides, and you don't even have to dick it out. You've only got to go and look at it. And sometimes you find mystic symbols, very rarely, such as this. And, and this is a, a universal... Symbol. It's a Cretian labyrinth. It's, it's right. called a Cretian labyrinth since it was on the back of coins from Knossos in 500 BC, but it's even older than that. And it's when we've seen it in more than one mine, and it may just indicate there's a labyrinth, but you could have all sorts of explanations about the pathway through life, or it could be. It looks like a womb, if you look at so the, the, the Red Indians also use that symbol. They consider it as a womb, or it can be the, the brain. And it looks as if it's trying to tell you something from the past. And, and that, to me, is very thought-provoking, very emotion-provoking. I mean, this one you said as a, uh, uh, coming from Nossos. I mean, uh, wasn't Zeus born in a cave uh, mm -hmm. on Crete, wasn't he educated? And equally yeah. Christianity, mm -hmm. I mean, the stable was yes. as such a okay. grotto as mm. that. And it and ends there. Uh, yes, yeah. Mithra. And you end up with a cross there, if you go through it, you end up with a cross, a path through life. If sure. it, That's as I like to, mm. to think of it. But from the practical point of view, some people have said to me, why have I been interested in the underground? And uh, I was a wartime child. Uh, my father cut a trap door in our back room because our house was actually sited on a hill. So the front part of the house uh, was on the roadway and the back part of the house fell away. And he'd actually watched the house being built and he knew that there was a cavity under the back. And he had had an a, a Anderson shelter built in the back garden, but unfortunately he'd built it over a natural spring, so it consequently filled with water. So um, we had this, instead, we therefore had this trapdoor cut in the back of the... Well, in, this in is the real floor. Rupert stuff. Yes, it <laughs> is. And uh, he then put some steps down there, and, and there were beds down there, cots, because it was my uncle and aunt, my mother and father, my two cousins and my brother and I, we all slept underground during the war, for most of it, actually, um, and even like in the doodle bug time, it was my responsibility to stand at the top of the stairs and tell my mother if I could hear any of the bombs coming. And we slept underground. Now, for us, it was safety and it was a refuge. Now, whether that means that I felt that's why I like going underground, because for me, I feel safe. Mm. I don't know. So it could be a psychological, <coughs> one of the psychological reasons why I like the underground is because I feel safe under the under there. We're not going to get mugged or run over or anything <laughs> like that, are you? It's no. safe. A very safe place. Other than by a ghost train. <coughs> well, my, my brother, my brother who, my brother and I were once interested in UFOs. I mean, it's a completely different subject. But um, we got thinking, wouldn't it be nice to create a complete new thing? Very difficult to create something completely new. And my brother David thought he'd have a go at creating underground UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd, be, you'd say you were going through a mine and you saw a kind of light hovering and moving erratically down the other end of the tunnel. Yeah. Or uh, a sort of thing with a screw come through the wall and go through the opposite wall. Um, the underground UFO, rather nice idea. It is a nice idea. <laughs> now we are getting Freudian. <laughs> <laughs> 
But oh. I wouldn't like, to, we, we never go underground on our own, it's a stupid thing to do. But I wouldn't like to be underground on my own, I find it a bit creepy, one other person sufficient. I think preferably three, three is a nice number, if there is an accident then there's one person to stay with the person who's hurt and one person to go for help. So really, you know, we would go with two but you know, if, if at all possible a minimum of three just, just for safety. And four is better than four, three. And four, is, four is better mm -hmm. still. What but you can have too many. Mm. What got you interested in it? What was your... What was your... I suppose really it was my father. Um, it was the stories about how he used to play in the mines at Godston when he was a boy. You know, he'd say, no, there's, there's one mine and we'd, we'd be in there all day, we'd get lost, there's hundreds of miles. And Could I he took draw labyrinths? A... <laughs> Could he draw labyrinths? He, he, he couldn't draw labyrinths. Um, I, I tended to take it with a pinch of salt. I didn't believe that there could really be hundreds of miles of tunnels. Um, but in his 60s, he remembered exactly where these entrances were. And he took me to Godston and, sure enough, it was there. And I couldn't believe it. And, and we, we clambered in. In, in. in those days, there were no gates on the mines. You know, we're talking you know, in, the, in the late 70s. Uh, we clambered in and we got lost. We got totally lost. He, he came, my mother came, my brother came. And I got totally hooked on it. Um, within two or three weeks, I, I'd been in contact with Malcolm. I joined the, the local cave and mining society. And my passion, or perhaps fanaticism, ha has... Has, has gone on from mm. there. Although I noticed, Nick, that when we were talking earlier about, um, well, psychoanalytical and Freudian areas, you, you didn't really say anything. Do you, do you not think it, there's...? It, it, it's not an area that I've put any thought into or an area that, that, that would really interest me. I, I'm solely an explorer. Mm. But, Nick, you, there's evidence in Godston that people went down there for lovemaking, it's always... There's, there is graffiti <laughs> on the walls that perhaps we should not show you here uh, tonight. Have you got photographs? Um, I not over not a of at, at home, yes. Everything is recorded. We packets have to photograph photos. everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> climbed over packets of unused condoms. And I don't think they were that old. <laughs> Mm. What's the but other then people diagram? make weapons a most peculiar place. Why not? It, it's it's you're, you're you're away from 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 any hassle. It's it's a calming situation. Why not? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, we we looked at the dean hole, and it, it, first of all, the thing was over hundred foot down. Secondly, the farmer had deposited pesticides in there, which produce genetic malformations, <laughs> and I also found a huge amount of Mayfair magazines down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. know. <laughs> we can't say somebody went 100 feet down. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what the other diagram was, Malcolm. The swastika, that's even more obscure. That's use, with the... That's in the same place, isn't it? Right. Um, yeah. it uh, in see. churchyards, and, it, and we've contacted people who study witchcraft, and both these symbols are used at witchcraft, but we found them together, and it's never been recorded that these that they're together. One witch got quite ecstatic over the fact that these two are together. And these are these are drawings the, the that you found on the, wall. the walls the of the mine. The wall. yeah. mm. So this right is right in the very innermost recess. Mm. This is kind of almost a swastika. What's the curved is that what swastika? swastika? Is the curved, curved swastika? swastika. Ah. And do you know what went on down there under these drawings? No, but I do get a feeling of peacefulness at the area. It was, it was something nice, I feel, went on down there. I, I feel that some sort of secret society were meeting down there. I must say, I don't get feelings like that at all. <laughs> there's, a, there's one area that we haven't covered, which mm -hmm. might be interesting to, to cover, um, is um, people who... Um, People who live underground. People troglodytes. What constitutes a troglodyte? Because I used to live in a basement flat. Well, so did I. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think a troglodyte really is, is someone who lives within the rock when, and all you've got actually is the, the face of the rock and you've got windows or a door set in the, mm. the rock face itself and the whole of the whole structure is, uh, is a building, a dwelling, mm. so that you actually get rooms that run in the front and then they run at the back. And, and there's an unwritten law, if you're a troglodyte, is that you can keep going backwards and digging out. 
but of course you mustn't go sideways because you get into your neighbours. Yeah. <laughs> in that case, one th I, I wasn't a chocolate no, no, no. Really. And the best site is, is at Kimber Edge in, in yes. Worcestershire, yeah. which is, is and Bridge North has with, some. with dwellings, with yeah. you know, square little windows and doors all over it. That's right. Mm. Um, and also Nottingham had some. Yes. But there is a move to house people underground now to build underground mm. houses yeah. because they're well insulated basically yeah. and there's a British uh, sheltering association yeah. which will uh, sell you house, underground houses. Right. Or really? And of course we're becoming terribly overpopulated. Are we all going to be moving underground like well, in the War of the Worlds? I'd like it. Sure. I'm I'm sure, isn't it? The yes, machine. I mean, it's, yeah. and also if you have to, or your face here on so that you've got light as well. Particularly for the front yeah, room. Let's take a vote on this. I'd hate to live underground. <laughs> no, really, I think in the basement. I think so too. But <laughs> if you no. could solve the daylight problem, I think it would be. Yes, well, you have. You've, you've got the ordinary yeah. daylight in the yeah. in the front room. I mean, you wow. don't have to have daylight at, at wasn't night, it do in you? Chiselhurst caves that people were after the war Absolutely. quite reluctant well, they, to move they out. They wouldn't leave, yeah. no. even after the war. I didn't yeah. know that. Really, yeah. they wanted yeah. to stay. So good. Yes, they liked it there. But really, none of you would want to live underground then. Oh, no, yes, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. No. There's a, there's a, really, so, so everyone except for Malcolm. I'd hate to. I'd rather live on. <laughs> I love going underground, but that's not the place to live. The place mm. to live is in the wide open space. Yeah. I think it's lovely because it'd be warm in winter and cool in summer. That's and we've all had this fantasy about I tunnelling have. downwards sure. below our houses, haven't we? Well, I've started. You've done it, I've still it. Yes, I know. You started. <laughs> Apart from it, whom do you think you are kidding? I mean, that's our ultimate destiny anyway, six foot under. That's true. Yes. <laughs> so. I think my, my ultimate would be to live in a normal house, but down below it. Oh. Yes. You know, to, to construct my own underground rooms. Like Williamson in Liverpool. Yes. <laughs> you know, that, that would be my, my ultimate ambition, to have a house, but to have an underground aspect Mad to it. Mad mulling 